special report from ABC4 News, academics amid the pandemic. Thank you for watching this ABC4 special report. I'm Emily Clark. Today we're looking deeper into the complicated process school districts face in determining how to safely reopen schools during this global health pandemic. As of this broadcast, it's been more than four months since most Utah students have seen the inside of a classroom. And since that initial executive order, so much still remains up in the air, leaving parents and teachers to deal with the uncertainty. Therefore, I'm announcing today a soft closure of all of Utah's public schools. Governor Gary Herbert initially closed Utah schools on March 16th due to the coronavirus. He eventually extended that closure through the end of the school year. When the governor gave the initial order to shut down schools, he said that they would need to help slow the spread of the virus. This is a health issue. Uh, we want to have education to continue, but we want to make sure we do it in a way that we protect the health and welfare of the people of Utah. He went on to say the state was doing everything it could to ensure children have safe environments to learn. Back on March 16th, Utah had just 38 cases of COVID-19. And according to current estimates from the Utah Department of Health today, Utah has more than 34,000 recorded cases and the state is moving forward with plans to reopen our schools. So the question at hand, can students return to schools safely? And what will the classroom environment look like when they do return? The governor has left the details to each individual school district to decide, and that has some teachers nervous. ABC4's Brittany Johnson spoke with a Granite School District teacher. As coronavirus cases continue to rise in Utah, some teachers are weighing the risk of going back to in-person teaching. I don't feel like my voice is being heard, listened to, and valued. It's why this teacher is speaking out. We've agreed to conceal the teacher's identity to protect their job. The teacher is skeptical about how safe it is for schools to reopen in the fall and says classes should remain solely online. We're going to be exposed all day long to kids who could or could not have the virus. The teacher within the Granite School District says the concerns are multifaceted. Some of the major unknowns include sanitation, personal protective equipment, and social distancing inside a classroom. There's no possible way they'll be six feet apart. And so that's going to be a problem. The teacher has a health condition and says potential exposure to kids who could have the virus is something they don't want to gamble with. I know that the health problems that I have, if I get this, I could die. If we end up getting the virus, the questions of that are even worse. Will they shut down just my class? Will those kids have other siblings? Will they shut down their classes? The teacher says they understand parents want to get back to normal and that online learning poses childcare challenges for some, but adds that's where businesses need to step up and help. I love my students and I want them to be safe. I can teach them adequately online. It's not as good as being in the classroom. Nothing can touch being in a classroom, but it's a good second and it's a safe second. Reporting in Salt Lake City, I'm Brittany Johnson, ABC4 News. We did reach out to the Granite School District for a response to this teacher's concerns. District spokesperson Ben Horsley had this to say in part, quote, we have spent the last several weeks developing strategies and plans to ensure the safety of all of our students and employees. Employees with underlying conditions and other health concerns do have options. Meanwhile, parents in Salt Lake City School District have pushed for in-person schooling. They gathered in front of the Salt Lake City School District building last week. The parents said physical classrooms provide essential services and structure for students. The district responded that it's a delicate balance of educating children and keeping everyone in schools healthy. There are kids that rely on the school for so many services that this remote learning puts our most at-risk kids in more risk. Unfortunately, we're not in a place with the pandemic where we're able to do that, um, which is why we're implementing the plans that we, that we are. The governor issued an order that would allow schools in moderate risk counties to have the option for in-person classes. The Salt Lake City School District will have the final vote on this by the end of the month. We've seen that balancing act play out across the state as all school districts develop their plans to reopen. In a panel discussion hosted by Voices for Utah Children, State Superintendent for Schools Sydney Dixon said to make this work, we're all going to have to make some sacrifices. 
we just can't have it all uh, unless we are willing to lean on as a state and do our part. And that I think that's, uh, I'll just say personally, that's the part that frustrates me a little bit. We all have to do our part to make it right for our kids and our teachers. All school districts have to submit their final reopening plans by August 1st. Coming up on academics amid the pandemic, we will hear more from our state superintendent, Cindy Dixon, on how students and teachers can return to the classroom safely. You're watching ABC4 News, academics amid the pandemic. But I'll let those people inside the schools and those who have responsibility for the education of these young people, K through 12, to make those kinds of decisions. When it comes to reopening our schools, the state of Utah has left much of in the hands of individual school districts to decide, but that does not mean they are without guidance from the state. State Superintendent of Schools Sydney Dixon sat down with our own Glenn Mills on this week's Inside Utah Politics. We do begin today with State Superintendent Sydney Dixon. She's here with the very latest information on going back to school. Superintendent, great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for giving us your time today. Thanks for having me, Glenn. A uh, very important conversation. Parents are trying to figure out what's going on as the uh, first day of school approaches. So let's first start off by talking about the strategy of going district by district and allowing each district to come up with their own game plan. Why is that the appropriate way forward in your mind? We learned a lot from soft closure in the spring and we used a one size fits all approach to just closing down and everybody leaning in. Well, we believe it was a good preventative measure and the right thing to do. It exacerbated this idea of local context matters. So creating a framework that has requirements in it plus recommendation allows for each school and each district to look at their context and determine based on how the virus is behaving and what the needs are of their community. They can develop a plan that works for their families and their students. What about in a situation though, where just because you live on one side of the street potentially or the other, your plan could be different than those who live in the next neighborhood over? Right, in the case of districts, of course, they're within many of the county boundaries. So I don't know that we'll have such a variance there. Charter by charter, of course, our charter schools have students from all over uh, the, the valley or wherever they live. And so um, that's a little bit different situation, but in terms of equity, that is a fundamental principle that everybody has to think about and look at. So um, you might have remote learning that's the bulk of a plan in one district or charter, but if you don't have all the elements in place of broadband in every home, uh, teachers who are able to teach online, or a blended model or face-to-face -face where it's appropriate. You have to think of every situation in every family and take those into account to serve them appropriately. What are you anticipating most? Are you anticipating mostly in-person, mostly online, or a hybrid of the two in most scenarios? Well, we know what the virus is and a little bit how it behaves, but until we all behave as a state and try to slow or stop the virus from spreading, we really won't know until we get closer. But our schools and our districts have been planning in a very nimble way. Um, they've looked at several different models, as you've mentioned. As we get closer, if we can't see that the virus, I think a lot of our district charters will go into a remote, uh, a remote modality. So I think most are trying to plan for a blended model so that families, teachers, and students have choice in districts that do go forward with the in-person model, do you anticipate most families will opt in for that? Or do you think there will be uh, some fear of going back in and families saying, no, I'd rather go the online route? I think every district and probably most, if not all of our charters have surveyed families and it depends on the county. If you have a county where people feel safe and there hasn't been a lot of spread, you're going to see a higher agreement of coming in person to person or a blended model. So it, it really depends. I don't know that we have that data yet. We'll see as we get closer, the comfort level of families, depending on the model that a district or charter chooses to use. But that will be an option for families who do not want to send their kids back to school, regardless of the district, they can go the online route? Correct, because we do have online opportunities throughout our state. We already have online schools that are part of districts and 
charters that are fully online. So even if a district doesn't offer that opportunity, there are online opportunities all throughout the state. For teachers who are concerned about returning to the classroom, are you confident there will be options for them to do so if that's what they see fit? I'm glad you asked that question because it's really important that the adults in our system, the teachers who are on the front line, feel safe and comfortable in going back to school as well. So if a, if a district or a charter is going back in a face-to-face -face or a blended model, I know that some are working hard to make accommodations for their teachers and trying to match classes uh, with teachers in an online setting for families who want to stay online and teachers who, want to, who need to teach online. It's a little more challenging for some of our remote uh, and rural areas, but in larger districts, that's probably an easier task. And I know everybody's talking about that and working on it. And we all know our teachers work really hard, as it is. Uh, I've heard some raise concerns about having to prepare for these different scenarios, maybe teaching in person, maybe online, maybe the hybrid of or, or the mix. Uh, are you concerned at all that we're going to overburden our teachers with this plan? Another great question, and so thanks for thinking about our teachers. A, a wise plan is one that takes into account how teachers can make sure that they're not teaching in three different ways, but really using scenarios where, for example, they load their content onto Canvas, or they're using one platform so that it makes it easier for families, where people are sharing loads where a teacher might teach online and another teacher might teach in person. So really thinking about ways that we mitigate teachers feeling like they have to teach in three different ways. We're seeing some models with cameras in classrooms so students can be at home and be a part of the classroom. Uh, we're seeing some where a full course is put online so students might take a couple of courses um, online. We've seen uh, districts kind of take different approaches to the mask mandate. What would you like to see? Should students be wearing masks when they return to school? Well, we know three things about trying to mitigate the spread, and that is distancing, masks, and hygiene, washing of hands. And all three of those are really important in our schools as well. So masks is part of that equation. Um, we're not saying that every student all day long will never be able to take their mask off because there will be times when they can be out, outside and distance, or maybe um, a few kids in an auditorium in distance, or, um, there are a variety of ways and places, certainly eating and drinking. Um, but we also have to think about the other factors and that's movement in hallways and entry and exit into school, wherever there are tight spaces and um, groups of students where they're moving from one class to another. Those are times of hallways and in classrooms if they're going to be uh, in close proximity and even more than 15 minutes at a time. So masks are one way to mitigate some of those um, characteristics of the virus and keeping it from spreading. Of course, risk is always there, but, but masks are a really important way to mitigate it. All right, State Superintendent Sydney Dixon, we sure appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Glenn. The wearing of masks is a fiercely debated issue among Utah parents and teachers. Utah Governor Gary Herbert has made face coverings mandatory in all K-12 schools as well as on school buses. ABC4's Haley Hendricks has more with state and health leaders on the importance of wearing masks in schools. As COVID-19 cases continue to spike in Utah, discussions surrounding mask wearing continues. Why wear a mask? For 140 years, we've known that masks have prevented the spread of disease, and that's why surgeons wear them. And as schools statewide prepare to welcome back students, plans need to be in place by August 1st. If you're maintaining your physical distance of six feet or more, you won't have to wear a mask. If you're eating lunch, those involved in kindergarten, the younger grades, there may be some needs to, in fact, allow some differences there on mask wearing. Uh, certainly common sense for those who have disabilities. Students who are sick should stay home and school districts are working to make sure students don't fall behind. I think there will be some allowances and flexibility that will be involved with this as a unique situation. Districts and schools are, are already having that discussion. What will it look like if students have um, an illness and need to be out of school? What sort of um, Things can be put in place. And in closing remarks, Governor Gary Herbert says while wearing a mask may be inconvenient, it's a small sacrifice for public health compared to sacrifices made during World War II.
we need to put it in perspective. We're not asking too much for us all to do what is necessary to, to sacrifice to get on top of this war with the coronavirus. Let's do it together. Health experts continue to remind people that the current science supports the effectiveness of wearing masks, but has not calmed the passionate feelings of those who would rather not wear them. ABC4's Nick McGurk was there as they clamored for their voices to be heard at a Utah County Commission meeting. Applause today for one message, no masks in schools. I think it's totally wrong. I think it's a political hoax and I am against the masks. This crowd, a demonstration against Governor Herbert's face covering mandate for schools. This was set up through the state. They gathered because of this man. County Commissioner Bill Lee, who says he's not against masks, but he is pushing for a compassionate exemption in Utah County schools to the mandated masks. As we can see in this in this county, there is quite a bit of divide on this issue. All I'm saying is I'm trying to save my grandma's life and I'm a teacher. Then do it correctly. I can't. I cannot stay home with her. We don't want to stay in with we don't want to have masks on. Tense moments as some held signs saying masks make schools possible. Since when do we have a constitutional right to put other people's lives in danger? We can't smoke in public places because it puts other people's lives in danger. There is no more public place than a government meeting, and it's here the group migrated for a county commission vote on that possible exemption for masks in schools. This is the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. We are supposed to be physically distancing, wearing masks, and so all of our medical, all of our medical experts, our Department of Health, everyone is encouraging us to do that. This room is not complying with these health guidelines. This creates a health concern for this meeting. So um, I'm going to suspend the rules and I'm going to make a motion to continue this entire meeting to another date. That was ABC4's Nick McGurk reporting. Utah County Commissioner Tanner Ainge, who you heard from there at the end, he did end that meeting early after it was initially called by fellow commissioner Bill Lee. Ainge later reiterated that the meeting was not safe due to people not wearing their masks. And as you can see here, they were definitely not social distancing. I mean, this was kind of an orchestrated um, political stunt from Commissioner Lee. And then the other interesting thing about the meeting is it actually, I feel bad for some of the sincere people who came to voice some of their concerns about K through 12 masks because this just was not the right forum. Angel went on to say whether or not masks will be required in schools is a decision that's made by the district, not the county level. It's not just in Utah County. A group called the Moms Against Masks Coalition rallied in Southern Utah. They showed up at the Washington County School District building last week. Washington County School District administrators responded that their current plans are flexible and allow parents to have a choice to move to remote or online schooling if they wish. I just don't agree with the mandating of masks. I'm not here in any capacity to tell any parent what they should or should not do with their child. Some of the most high risk populations can be in our schools. And I personally would never want to knowingly infect or even unknowingly infect someone else. The school district said more than 60% of their bus drivers, bus drivers are considered high risk. Multiple Utah school districts have already released their proposed back to school plans. If you would like to know the plan for your student's school, we are tracking all of them as they are released. You can find them on our website, abc4.com slash coronavirus. As part of their back to school plans, many school districts are putting extra sanitary measures in place for that return to the classroom. How they're keeping classrooms clean coming up. Students and teachers prepared to return back to school during the pandemic. Many school districts are looking at ways to sanitize classrooms and schools quickly, all to stop the spread of COVID-19. ABC 4's news, ABC 4 News investigator Jason Wynn shows us school districts are also looking to increase airflow to the schools. At Liberty Elementary in Salt Lake City, the plexiglass is up in the main office, and most of the focus is on the classrooms. Every classroom will have a supply of hand sanitizer and their own disinfectant. 
The district is implementing the same procedures at Liberty Elementary across the district. Each school is getting a deep cleaning this summer. During the school year, the district will increase the frequency of cleaning. All the touch spots are going to be hit at least four times a day. All the restrooms are going to be cleaned at least four times a day. The district says each classroom will take about 30 minutes at night to clean. Custodians will be primarily using the electrostatic sprayer. It's EPA approved and it's 100% not toxic. All of the cleaning materials will be made in-house and each system costs roughly $6,500. We need water, we need electricity, and we need salt. And we can create uh, endless volumes of the cleanser and the disinfectant. And to make sure that the airflow is clean, custodians are going to be replacing air filters about every quarter, and it's going to be dictated on the inspection and maintenance logs. The district got the okay from the fire marshal to keep all the classroom doors open to help with air. ABC4 News found while talking to the majority of the 41 school districts, many of them are working on implementing the same type of procedures as Salt Lake City School District. I'm Jason Wynn, ABC4 News. That does it for this ABC4 News special report. Thank you for joining us. We do continue the discussion online. You can find us at abc4.com. We'll see you right back here at 10 o'clock.